Well, we're going to go ahead and get started on our program. So if I could have your attention. See, I'm not as good at this as Wade. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, glass clinkers. Wade, clearly I don't have your natural authority, you know, aura about me that people just start quieting down. Uh, my name is Tom Giovanetti. I'm the president of the Institute for Policy Innovation, and I'm here to kick off our program. Please continue to keep eating. Um, any, any public speaker has learned how to talk over the sound of people eating, and in particular, please eat your dessert. Because if you don't, the IPI staff will stay here and, and go around and, you know, like, what, what, what did we all learn about in, in North Texas over the last few weeks? Army worms? Everybody got their lawns destroyed by army worms? We will spread like army worms all over the room and consume all the chocolate desserts. I, I want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'm particularly excited about, about our speaker today. I've been a, a personal fan of Justice Bullock for years, and uh, I think you're in for a real treat. And I want to, again, repeat our appreciation to the Haddon Sumner's Foundation for underwriting this series of events. Um, I have the unenviable task at a nonprofit organization of also being the fundraiser. And I comb through lots of foundation mission statements. And one thing about the Haddon Sumner's Foundation that is refreshing is they are a mission-oriented foundation. Uh, the full name of the foundation is the Haddon W. Sumner's Foundation for the Study and Teaching of the Science of Self-Government. And uh, boy, that aligns just perfectly with, uh, with our beliefs at IPI. But to self-govern, a people have to be informed. They have to understand the issues. They have to understand their institutions. They have to understand why we have a Supreme Court and what is its role. And so that sort of public education on policy is why IPI exists. And so we very much appreciate you coming today and we appreciate the Haddon Sumner's Foundation for underwriting these events. Speaking of the Haddon Sumner's Foundation, I want to recognize our Sumner scholars. Where are our Sumner scholars? Can you, there we go. We appreciate you all coming today. We know that, um, I know from having a college student that you're very busy and that there are many demands on your time. And we appreciate the fact that you carved out time for today's event. And you will be having a special session afterward with the speaker. So as soon as we're finished with the program, if you could make your way across the hall, through the buffet, to the last room on the left. And that's where we will be doing your special session with Justice Bullock. Now, a, li a little bit of housekeeping for today. On the table, you will find three by five cards and pens, and those are for writing your questions down because we will do a moderated Q&A with Justice Bullock after his talk. Uh, we want to answer as many of your questions as possible, but you can help us by making your questions short and concise and by writing with the clearest possible handwriting because I can tell you, uh, flipping through these cards on stage, uh, sometimes we can't even make out what's, what, the, what the questioner intended. So help us out there with clear, short questions. And uh, we'll try to answer as many of them as possible. And now let me briefly introduce Justice Bullock. In your program, you have a longer bio. I'm not going to read the long bio. Um, but I want to sort of tell you uh, so something about Justice Bullock that I find particularly endearing. Um, if you watched the Kavanaugh hearings, and if you're sort of a fan of, you know, Supreme Court, <laughs> or is, is anyone a fan of Supreme Court nomination battles? <laughs> I kind of choked on that as it was coming out. Um, you know, there are people who spend their entire careers working toward being a judge someday. And they go to the right school, they go to the right law school, they join all the right societies, they clerk for all the right judges. Their goal in life is to become a judge. That's what they set out to do. Uh, Clint Bullock did not set out to be a judge. In fact, if you look at Clint Bullock's career, it's almost as if it was designed to make him toxic as a judge because he spent his career suing governors and mayors and cities and states. Uh, and, you know, those are the same people you're counting on someday to appoint you to something. So it's, it's one of those wonderful serendipitous things that, that someone as wonderful as, as Clint Bullock could actually get appointed to the Arizona Supreme Court. Uh, because he has spent his career fighting for liberty. He was a co-founder of the Institute for Justice, which is a public interest law firm for liberty. Uh, the Institute for Justice 
uh, sues governments for restricting people's ability to be entrepreneurs, for violating people's property rights. Uh, they're a wonderful organization, and Clint Bullock is the co-founder of that organization. Uh, Clint Bullock is also one of the pioneers in fighting for school choice. He, he, won, he argued and won a number of critical court cases in states around the country that, that, that fought against states' attempts to shut down school choice. And so one of the great heroes of the school choice movement is Clint Bullock. And then he was vice president for litigation at the Goldwater Institute in Arizona, where again, uh, they sued governments defending liberty, defending property rights, defending the ability of people to start businesses and improve themselves economically. And then somehow, remarkably, managed to get himself appointed in 2016 to the Arizona Supreme Court. Uh, so I want to, I've got one other thing I wanted to mention. Oh, and that's right, and you argued two cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, is that correct? Two cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. So uh, while I would love to see you on the U.S. Supreme Court, I'm still thrilled that you're on the Arizona Supreme Court. One of Clint's expertises, actually, is in the use of state constitutions to defend liberty. Uh, you know, we tend to overlook the degree to which many of our state constitutions actually have stronger protections in them for individual liberty than the U.S. Constitution has. But yet we overlook and we neglect those as weapons, and that's one of Clint's expertises. So uh, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Arizona Supreme Court Justice Clint Bullock. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, it's so great to be here in Dallas. I love Texas. Uh, I romanced my wife in Texas uh, when she was uh, working for then Lieutenant Governor Rick Perry. Um, and I was actually hoping to be in Dallas for the first time in my life on a Sunday night to see what Dallas is like when the Cowboys win. <laughs> Gonna have to try that one again. <laughs> And this is mostly for the young people in the room, but I will be leaving Dallas with a truly a life lesson. And honest to God, if you internalize this, if you internalize this lesson, it will make you successful in your life. And that life lesson is never play for the field goal. <laughs> Um, Tom, it was uh, when you were talking about the uh, uh, possibility of me uh, being on the Supreme Court and the, the remote odds that I would ever be on the Arizona Supreme Court, for whatever reason, it came back to um, an experience I had uh, during the first Bush administration when I got a phone call uh, from someone high up in the Bush administration and uh, they said, hey, we want to float your name uh, as a possible candidate for Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. Um, and I said, well, that's really, really neat, but I, I don't I don't think that you know. I, I, I actually want to uh, go through that process and serve in that position. And the person said, oh, we're not actually going to nominate you. Um, <laughs> we just want to float your name and get, <laughs> get people so nervous that the person we actually nominate will be considered palatable. So you may hear my name mentioned for the U.S. Supreme Court the next time around. That may be a, <laughs> a better way to go. Um, thank you so much for having me today. And, and uh, the, the topic that I uh, am speaking about today is, is one that is, is very near and dear to my heart. In fact, uh, six years ago, I wrote a book um, called Twofer, and the subtitle of that book was Electing a President and a Supreme Court. And the argument that I made in that book was that the most important thing that a president does is to nominate justices to the United States Supreme Court because there is nothing a president will do, nothing a president will do that will have a more enduring legacy than the people that that uh, person appoints to the U.S. Supreme Court. 
I would love to say that that book made the New York Times bestseller list, but if I did, I would be utterly and totally lying. Uh, that book just absolutely died with a thud. <laughs> Nobody was interested in this topic. If I had written it a year ago, this might have been on the New York Times bestseller list. But in any event, it's, it's, it's gratifying in a, in, in a perverse way to have a thesis that is borne out even if the people, even if, if people at the time don't, uh, uh, don't, don't really buy into it. But I think, I think we have seen, uh, first with the nomination of, of Neil Gorsuch, but certainly in spades with the nomination of, of, uh, of Brett Kavanaugh, uh, that that is exactly what's uh, what's happening, and so my topic today is why is it why is it that we just witnessed and experienced such a cataclysmic uh, uh, nomination battle, and in fact we may see uh, more of the same <clears throat> in the future, and I think there are four reasons why the stakes for U.S. Supreme Court nominations have, have gotten uh, so high, and I'm gonna go through uh, each of them. And the first one is illustrated by a story that I absolutely love uh, about former uh, Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, who was, uh, as a litigator, uh, a role model for me as uh, I was developing my litigation career. Uh, Thurgood Marshall served many years on the U.S. Supreme Court, and toward the end of his tenure, he was interviewed by the Washington Post Sunday Magazine, and they said, you know, you're getting elderly. Have you given any thought to retiring? And Justice Marshall, in his usual very direct way, said, no, I am absolutely not going to retire. He said, I was appointed to a life uh, tenure, and I intend to live every single year of, of that. He said, not only that, I plan to live to be over 100 years old. And he said, not only that, when I finally die, I plan to be shot by a jealous husband. <clears throat> That uh, I just I just loved that story when I when I read it, <laughs> and uh, that actually exemplifies the fact. And and there's a, an old saying in Washington D.C. that if you want to live to be very old, get yourself appointed to the United States Supreme Court, and that's the first. Uh, reason why the stakes are so high in judicial nominations, and that is the framers' vision of lifetime tenure for federal judges. Now, when we think about that now, uh, and we see, you know, we hear that example of, of Justice Marshall, it seems like a, a huge deal, and it is a huge deal. At the time of the founding, though, even though it was an innovation, it was not a very big deal. And the reason it was not a very big deal is that the people who were appointed to the United States Supreme Court at the time of the founding were older than the average age of death. The people appointed were older than the average age of death. So that the expectancy would be that if you appointed someone to the US Supreme Court, he would die the next day. <laughs> This is what the founders thought of when they thought of lifetime tenure. It really didn't amount to very much. And a few of them, like uh, uh, John Marshall, uh, surprised people and, and lived for, for a long time. But at the time, uh, that was not true at all. Fast forward to the year 2018. Justices are being appointed at a younger age than ever before, and they are living uh, for a greater period than, than ever before. So lifetime tenure has become a huge factor uh, in, the, in the importance of nominations to the United States Supreme Court. Justice Anthony Kennedy, who just retired, was appointed by Ronald Reagan. And when I talk about legacies, you know, how many times do you bump into something today that Reagan did? But Anthony Kennedy, you know, was, uh, uh, you know, lived and, and was on the Supreme Court through all of those presidential administrations uh, to today and had obviously an enormous impact on the court and, and on all of the issues that, that touch the lives of each and every one of us 
um, in, in this room. Uh, he served, uh, he, he was appointed and served through eight presidential terms. The average tenure of a United States Supreme Court justice now is 32 years. That is more than IPI has existed as an organization, right? I mean, that is just astounding. Clarence Thomas was appointed at age 43. If he serves as long as the man he succeeded, Thurgood Marshall, uh, if, he, if he serves to the same age, he will have served in, on the US Supreme Court for 40 years. So this is, this is absolutely huge, what a president does today. And it's obviously very intentional because um, I, 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 a, a woman who was uh, one of the prime candidates uh, for a possible nomination, Diane Sykes on the Seventh Circuit, um, it's, it's blatant age discrimination, but she's 60 years old right now. If you, are, if you have a six in the first digit of your age, don't bother applying for the US Supreme Court. They want young judges, and they want judges who are going to serve for a very, very long time. The second reason why the stakes have grown so high is the explosive growth in government at every level. And I, I didn't think that there were a lot of people who distinguished themselves uh, during the, the recent nomination battle. But one person who I thought really, really did, and it's, it's a guy, I am, I, having spent my entire career suing politicians, I tend to not say very warm things about them as a general rule. But one guy who I absolutely adore is Senator Ben Sass of Nebraska. And every time this guy opens his mouth, it's a civics lesson. And in his opening statement uh, in the Kavanaugh hearings, he said, the reason we are at each other's throats is because we don't do our job anymore. We punt issues to the United States Supreme Court that we should be resolving. We pass laws that are, are uh, that are obs uh, obscure and vague that have to be interpreted. We pass things along to administrative agencies uh, that have to be decided by the courts. If we would do our jobs, we would not have uh, a, a Supreme Court that is as powerful as it has become over the years. And of course, the Supreme Court was not intended to be a powerful institution. It does have a very, very important job in our constitutional republic, and that is to negative, that is to, uh, uh, to strike down laws or actions of the other two branches of government that violate the Constitution. This is set forth uh, first uh, in the, the Federalist Papers, number 78, by Alexander Hamilton. Um, that uh, in order to have uh, freedom, we need a court system that will hold the other two branches to the boundaries of their defined powers. But Hamilton warned that the judiciary could itself become a dangerous branch if it ever acquired executive or legislative powers. So I would submit that the courts have done not enough of policing the other branches of government and too much in assuming executive and, and legislative powers over the years. And as a result of that, uh, we have a, a very, very powerful judiciary. But it is the, the growth of government that uh, uh, has really uh, made the Supreme Court so important. And just a couple of examples of that. The United States Code is the compilation of all federal laws. It took 169 years from 1789 to 1958 for the US Code to number 11,000 pages, or 11,000 pages of federal laws in uh, 1958. It only took another 42 years to the turn of the century for that number to quadruple. So a quarter the number of years, four times the number of federal laws. The administrative agencies are even more explosive in their growth. In 1960, all federal regulations put together numbered 22,000 page, 22, pages. Today, 
60 years later, it's over 150,000 pages. So if you, if you think about this, uh, if the number of unconstitutional laws has stayed the same, then you would s expect to see like four to six times as many US Supreme Court uh, decisions striking down unconstitutional laws because the, the, of the explosive growth in the laws. But we haven't seen that happen. And I don't think that you can accept the premise that the percentage of unconstitutional laws is the same. And that is because, again, uh, to credit Senator Sass, Congress itself and the president himself have not uh, participated in restraining their own powers. If you go back, I am a, a, a student of the 14th Amendment, the, the post-Civil War uh, era. And if you look at the debates over the Civil Rights Act of, of 1866, which was passed right after the Civil War, there was one question that Congress debated over and over again. They asked themselves, do we have the power to enact this law? Do we have the constitutional authority to enact this civil rights law? Again, fast forward to today, when is the last time you heard Congress debating over whether it had the power to do something? You never hear that anymore. It's like, this is a good idea, let's pass it. The same thing with the president. When, when President Bush signed the McCain-Feingold law, he said, I have profound constitutional problems with this bill, but I'm gonna sign it anyway and let the courts figure it out. And that's exactly what he did. So we wonder why it is such a big deal when someone is, is nominated to the United States Supreme Court, and that's, that's one of the explanations. The third reason why the stakes have grown so high is that the science of appointing judges who will stay true to the principles of the president who appointed that judge have, has improved exponentially. Lincoln, FDR, and Nixon all tried to pack the courts with judges who would vote the way that they wanted them to. All three of them utterly and totally failed, and, and all three are, are really interesting stories. That doesn't happen anymore. If a Democratic president appoints a justice, that justice is almost certain to be on the liberal side of most five to four votes. And if a conservative president nominates a conservative justice, that justice is almost certain to be on, on the conservative side of, of divided votes. And why is that? It is because interest groups on both sides of the divide have gotten so good at developing people who have a strong constitutional philosophy, whether it's liberal or conservative, who will then stay true to that philosophy when, uh, when those people are appointed. On, on the right, the organization that has the most to do with that is the Federalist Society. Um, and uh, you know, they, they uh, uh, help to identify judges who, who are not simply opportunistic, but are people who are, who are really immersed in a textualist or originalist philosophy, and the same thing with groups on, on the left. So that there has not been a mistake, and by mistake I mean a, ju a justice being appointed by a president who disappoints that president. There's not been a mistake since David Souter, who is no longer on, on the, uh, the United States Supreme Court. And again, what that means is that whoever is being appointed, the stakes are enormously high because you, you can pretty safely bet that the person is going to stay true uh, to the philosophy of the president who has a, appointed uh, that person. And then finally, the reason the stakes were so high this time was because the balance on the court was at stake. When the balance of the court, when a conservative justice replaces a conservative justice, like Gorsuch for, for Souter, uh, or for the, the last several Democratic uh, ad, uh, appointments replacing uh, liberal justices, 
things don't really change. People are relatively, relatively mellow about it, uh, and it becomes a pretty routine thing. Just think about when was the last time that a, a nominee to the court changed the balance on the court? It was the last time that a nominee was Clarence Thomas. And I don't know about you, but this nomination reminded me a great deal of the battle over Clarence Thomas. I mean, almost eerily similar. And that was because Clarence Thomas replaced Thurgood Marshall and turned a 5-4 liberal court into a 5-4 conservative court, and the stakes were enormous. This time, of course, Kavanaugh is replacing his own mentor, Anthony Kennedy, but Anthony Kennedy is the swing justice on the Supreme Court, uh, conservative on a, on a whole host of issues, but very liberal on a whole host of especially social issues and some, uh, some criminal issues. And as a result, now the swing justice is John Roberts, who is far more conservative than Anthony Kennedy. As a result, the stakes are just just enormous. And, and, and so uh, if, uh, uh, if uh, another justice uh, who is on the liberal side would be replaced by Trump, or if someone on the conservative side were to be replaced by a Democratic president, I think you would see very, very much uh, the same sort of thing that we uh, saw this time. So what's gonna happen um, with a Justice Kavanaugh? Now I think with someone like Kavanaugh, he has a long history, and so I think you can fairly safely project uh, where he will go on a number of issues. Um, and I think that, um, uh, by and large, um, the, the issues that people were most concerned about are not the issues where things are going to change the most. Um, and that's because of the principle of stare decisis, uh, uh, honoring past precedent, and where that is most tangible is where a liberty is recognized by the court that a lot of people rely upon. And so I predict, um, and oh boy, have I been wrong as often as I've been right on these things, but I predict that Roe versus Wade will not be overturned. Uh, and I predict that the Obergefell decision uh, that recognized a right to, uh, to gay marriage will not be overturned. I, I, that would, that's a different thing than saying that more restrictions on abortion will, will uh, not be upheld, I think. Uh, that they will, uh, but I don't see either of those decisions um, being overturned. So where will the changes take place with a Kavanaugh replacing uh, Kennedy? Well, first of all, uh, an issue that is near and dear to my heart because of my background uh, at the Institute for Justice, the issue of eminent domain, uh, where uh, private parties are uh, allowed to use the power of government to take property for private rather than public use. That was a 5-4 decision in which Kennedy was in the majority. He usually voted in favor of private property rights in Kelo. He was the swing justice to uphold that use of eminent domain. I would expect um, that Kavanaugh would, um, would vote to uh, uphold, um, or sorry, to strike down that use of eminent domain. Right here in, um, in Texas, a recent decision uh, involving the use of race uh, in university admissions. I think everyone expected that, that uh, Texas was going, the state of Texas was gonna lose that lawsuit. In fact, I think the New York Times was predicting with uh, great confidence uh, that Texas was going to lose. Kennedy switched sides. He had always opposed uh, the use of race in public university admissions, always, until the recent UT, UT decision. U2, I'm, you can tell I'm a rock and roll fan, right? <laughs> UT decision um, in which uh, he voted to uphold uh, the use of race. I suspect that will change with, with Kavanaugh. One issue uh, in which Kavanaugh is especially passionate is the issue of religious liberty. 
And there was a case recently involving uh, public funds that were, uh, that were denied to a private uh, religious school in Missouri. Um, the state of Missouri has a fund uh, for playgrounds. Uh, they give money to schools for playgrounds, but they forbid the money to be used by religious schools. Um, and the US Supreme Court struck down that law, but in a footnote, the plurality said, this decision only applies to playgrounds. Um, <laughs> yes, that was my reaction. I'm like, oh boy, this is a big US Supreme Court decision, and it only, only applies to playgrounds. So, so we don't know uh, what, the, uh, what the issue, what the outcome would be for, you know, say, garden hoses or something like that. <laughs> So uh, I, I suspect, uh, and in fact, Kavanaugh uh, um, was, uh, Tom mentioned that I had defended school choice programs. Kavanaugh was part of the defense team uh, defending uh, vouchers in, in Florida, so I had some, some interaction with him. But perhaps the biggest area is uh, where I think Kavanaugh will have an impact is an area that most people, many people would consider utterly and totally boring. And that is in the area of administrative law. But it is the area of law that impacts so many of us as businesses and as, as citizens. There's just been, as I noted, this tremendous growth uh, in the, admin the power of the administrative state under a doctrine called the Chevron Doctrine, where courts defer to the expertise of administrative agencies. The New York Times did a, an incredible piece looking at what the common denominator was for the people that Trump had appointed to the US Supreme Court and to the courts of appeals. And of all the things, it wasn't abortion, it wasn't any of these other issues that I've been talking about, it was the administrative state. They all have a hostility to the power of the administrative state. And uh, Gorsuch, in particular, um, who I consider myself, uh, uh, we were separated at birth and have only recently met each other. But nonetheless, uh, Gorsuch is, is uh, a huge uh, opponent of the judicial abdication to administrative agencies, and I think we'll see some substantial movement in that area. Kavanaugh is exactly the same way. So it's these kinds of issues, and these are, these are important issues, uh, but they're not the sexy issues, or they're not the galvanizing issues that, that, that get people so, uh, so fired up. Um, so, uh, and, and that's why I think that, that we have uh, such uh, such venom uh, in these in these nominations. I want to conclude and then look forward to your questions. I want to conclude by uh, just giving a, a word about how I desperately hope that these nominations do not undercut public support for the American judiciary. When I look around um, the world today and we see the rise of authoritarian uh, nations, countries, on both the, the right and the left. I, I actually don't see a difference between them. If they're authoritarian, I don't care whether they're supposedly right wing or left wing. They're bad in my book. And the first thing they do, whether it's Venezuela, whether it's China, whether it's Poland, whether it's Hungary, they destroy the independence of the judiciary. And it's, it's a common theme among all authoritarian countries. In Poland, they suddenly imposed a, a mandatory retirement age. They got rid of a whole bunch of judges, many of whom had ruled against the government. And we see in Venezuela, the judiciary abolished the legislature. I mean, boy, how many judges would love to do that, you know? <laughs> It doesn't happen in the United States, and I think we too often take for granted what we have in the judiciary in the United States. And I, I litigated in, in 16 states 
um, and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia, including the state of Texas. And it is so nice to be able to walk into a courtroom and know that you have a level playing field, that David can beat Goliath and that you will have a fair shot of winning your case. That is the exception in the world not the rule. And we have to, we have to hold dearly to the integrity and the independence of the judiciary. And I want to finish with one little anecdote that I think perhaps illustrates that theme more than any other case I've ever been involved with. I mentioned the Kilo case, the eminent domain case that uh, Justice Kavanaugh may, may vote to overturn if he has a chance to do it. But my colleagues and I at the Institute for Justice were very active in the area of eminent domain. And the first case we took on, the, the odds were really against us. The law was against us. Um, and we wanted to find a first case that would be so, uh, the facts would be so outrageous that we might be able to, to overcome the law that was against us and actually win and establish a first precedent for eminent domain. This is a few years before the Kilo case. And we found that case in my home state of New Jersey where uh, the owner of a casino uh, decided that he wanted a parking lot for his limousines. And the property was owned uh, by a little gold and silver shop a little Italian restaurant named Sabatini's. And if you're a New Jersey person, you look out for your Italian restaurants, okay? <laughs> and the, the home of a feisty elderly widow named Vera Koking. And the casino developer went to them. He said, I want your property. What's the price? And they all said, we don't have a price. We don't want to sell. We want to stay here. So the casino owner went to the city of Atlantic City and he said, I need you to use your power of eminent domain. City of Atlantic City said, what's good for casinos is good for Atlantic City. Of course we will do that. We went to court. Uh, they tried to take the land and I'm happy to say uh, that we won that lawsuit. But it was one of those rare lawsuits where everybody ended up with a happy ending. Uh, for, the, for Sabatini's, uh, they continued serving good Italian food for decades. Mrs. Koking was able to live out the rest of her years in her home. The casino owner went on to be elected President of the United States. <laughs> And my colleagues and I were able to say, we beat the president in litigation. Seriously, what country, what other country could that happen? And that is the crown jewel that is at the center of all of this controversy. No matter what we do in these nomination battles, no matter how passionate we get, we must preserve that crown jewel. Thank you so much for letting me share these thoughts with you today.